Hi everybody, I thought I'd start with uh, my glasses like that, quite alluring. Today's guest is rather splendid. I first saw her in uh, Goodness Gracious Me, that launched several big talents onto the scene around the same time that uh, Marion and Jeff came out, around 2000. And we've never really had a proper chat, so I'm very much looking forward to spending some time with her and with you. Please welcome Nina Wadia. Hey, there she is. Oh, I'm so sorry. So stressful. <laughs> oh, listen, it, it's so funny because it's come on a day when I've done three of these and we have had our very own technical, as Dennis Norden would have called them, cock-ups uh, ourselves. So oh, you're, you're, in, you're in very good company. Fabulous. The, the viewers should know that we've spent the last half an hour me listening to Nina sigh, basically, in, in, a, in a more and more exasperated way with each passing 10 minutes. Did you hear the smashing of, you know, my husband's computer in the background and a lot of swearing as well? No, all, all, all I heard was your voice and then, and then I'd hear... <sighs> <laughs> it's so frustrating. And you know the thing that makes it more frustrating, and this won't apply to you, but it applies to me, I've never been this old, and there's a horrible feeling that it's just a byproduct of my age. <laughs> it's true, I feel the same. <laughs> Enough of me moaning about my, my aging. Um, how are you? It's nice to talk to you. How are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. You look like you're in a sort of NASA control center. There's a keyboard, <laughs> there's a pop shield for a mic, there's a, there's a flat screen, listen to me, flat screen television. Ooh, look at you. Well, <laughs> This this is the setup for my husband's studio. He's a composer. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so in when the pandemic hit, uh, we couldn't travel into town for his work. So we decided to just set up a place at home, as most people did during yeah. that time. Yeah. So now this is set up for my voiceovers. This is set up for uh, my little podcast. Uh, so that kind of stuff. I was thinking that, that Goodness Gracious Me came out the same time that I did Marion and Jeff and human remains but in fact it because i think of us all coming through at the same time but in fact you predated my stuff that was my first foray i mean i'd done a lot of radio i did the radio drama company and loved it but when i first joined i was desperate to get on it because as a brown actor to get the opportunity to be anybody yeah. uh regardless of race color even sex it doesn't matter because on radio as long as your voice can do it with um you know the pitch the tone your accent whatever it is you can be anybody. Um, and that's why I loved radio. It's so freeing. In fact, one of my worst ever, ever auditions uh, was actually to get into the radio drama company. I had a lovely first agent who had said to me, all right, I've managed to get you an audition. They don't normally give it to kind of brand new people. So she said, um, right, it's on Tuesday, the 6th of May. And I said, brilliant, Tuesday, the 6th of May. Monday morning, this was when I was 20, I was still living with my parents, and Monday morning, phone rang, my dad was like, Nina, there's someone from Radio Drama Company saying you're not there. And I went, what? No, 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 it's my audition's Tuesday, 6th of May, and my dad goes, well, it's Monday's the 6th of May, which is today. <gasps> oh. And I went, no, and I ran downstairs, I was in my pajamas, and I went, uh, yeah, it, it's a three hour long audition because it was part workshop, part monologue, part duologue, all this kind of stuff. And I said, but I can get there in an hour. Please, can I still come in? And this producer went, well, you can, but you'll have missed a third of the audition. I went, I don't mind. I don't care. So off to the tube station, get on the underground. I get to Green Park and the train just stops. Oh, no. Because this was the time of the IRA threats, bomb threats. So the tube stopped in the underground of Green Park. My heart's like this, and I'm like, why is this happening? And um, we, we were there for about a half hour. I walk up, I stand in front of that, that building, <laughs> just on Langham Place, the BBC radio <laughs> building, and I'm like, okay, I have two options. I either go in and just do this, and they can laugh at me, or I walk away. And I thought, oh, don't care at this point. So I get into the building, I go up to the sixth floor, and the main producer is standing there. She's got her arms folded, 
And she just looked at me. She literally went, you're shitting me. <laughs> and I went, I'm sorry, man, not my fault because my agent. And she went, I don't want to know. She said, you can't do any part of the workshop because we've done that. Everyone's gone home, except for a lovely actor called Lyndon Gregory, who was walking past, had already gathered what had happened and said, I'll do a duologue with her. And I thought, oh my gosh, I love this man. <laughs> At the end of the week, they rang and said, um, actually, we really loved her. Uh, we wanted to do this and I got wow. the job. <laughs> and how long were you part of that company? Uh, you get a year's contract, yeah. Um, and at the end of the year, some in those days they used to offer you a few months more if you wanted it. But uh, I then got my first break in theatre at Theatre Royal Stratford East, and I did seven years worth of theatre back to back. Just I would go from one job, get seen by someone, move on to the next job. And my last theatre job there was Do You Eat with Your Fingers, which was the precursor for me to Goodness Grace Me. So it was yeah. a show I'd co-written yeah. with a bunch of friends and I got seen by the then, you know, uh, Sherrod, the lovely Sherrod Sardana, main writer um, of Goodness Gracious Me and uh, Anil Gupta, producer. And uh, they said, yeah, we've been looking for a, another girl to join the show and uh, would you join us? And I was terrified. And the fact that the British audience took us to their hearts was amazing and what it was such an incredible feeling and it's the first time I really felt like I belonged in the UK like properly belonged really really yeah. because I hadn't settled yet you know my parents I grew up in India then Hong Kong and then came out here and I didn't quite know if I was going to continue living here or if I wanted to move to America to try acting or but then goodness gracious me happened and people just embraced us so beautifully that I thought Oh, yeah, this is my home now. <laughs> you know, it just felt right. This shocked me. You married your husband yeah. after being with him for four months. Within the first five minutes of meeting him, um, he had told me he was going to marry me. And he was just like, well, are you seeing anyone? And I thought, I don't even know you. I was like, uh, not that it's any of your business, but uh, <laughs> actually I've just broken up with someone. Oh, okay. Uh, what kind of music do you like? was the second question. He is a composer. And I thought, of oh, course, I said, um, I don't know, all kinds of music. Oh, so you're not really a music lover. What? Um, yeah, um, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> I just went, what just happened? <laughs> um, so I thought, this man is not right. <laughs> Wait, was this, sorry, did you say this was the first time you met him? First time I met him, I'd known him less than five minutes. And Good uh, God. Yeah. So, so what, what had prompted him then? You must have discussed this since. What had prompted he, him to he, say that? He just knew. He literally just said he knew. We just then would talk every day on the phone. He just made me laugh a lot. From the minute we met, we laughed a lot. But I thought he was just kidding and messing about with the whole marriage thing. But he genuinely wasn't. He just felt it was right. Wow. And there was a very specific moment. My mum was upstairs doing a home dialysis and... He was lying on her bed with his head back like this, reading to her from a magazine and just making her laugh. And I walk in the house and all I hear is my mum going, stop it, Ren, and it hurts, you're making me laugh, it hurts like this, right? And he was just making her laugh. And I absolutely fell in love with him in that moment. You did a long run, I'm not sure how long, in EastEnders. Now, yeah. the, I've always got the impression that that, just from afar, but that that kind of takes over your your life. It does, um, but it's a, it's a weird one because if you think about it, the cast in EastEnders, you know, there's about what 45, 50 of us right. at, at any given time. It's yes, so cast. okay, so so yeah, I, I know what you're going to say. It, yeah. it, it, you're in the background for some, you're not mm, so much. So so typically then, typically in in a week, how often would you be working? Would you have weeks where you did nothing at all? Yes, there were. I mean, with the Masood family, there were because, you know, um, when it's your storyline, then you have no life apart from EastEnders. You're in, I mean, I was I was saying to this, someone, I actually counted at one point, I was learning 150 pages worth of lines in a week. Oh, that terrifies um, me. Oh. And it's towards the end of doing that, that I remember kind of going, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm tired of doing that. And, and I'm tired of my character and I want to do something different. I yeah. want to go back to comedy. Comedy just keeps you alive. Uh, but it was scary that whole time of 
should I leave, should I not? Because, you know, EastEnders is such a, a great show and a big show. And it's you're taken into the hearts of people. How, how long were you in it for? I went in for six months. I did six and a half years, which was crazy wow. to wow. me. And wow. with EastEnders, the fans take you really to their heart. They You belong to them, you know, and to the point where there's good and bad. You know, I had scary incidents coming out of the uh, studio where I was driving out one day and this guy jumped in my car and said, oh, can you sign this photo? And I went, get out of my car. And he was like, I'm not going to hurt you. Can you just sign this? I went, get out of my car. Did he tell you that he was going to marry you as well? <laughs> Only took six months for that one. Over. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he, he did, like, of course he got out of the car, but then he, St stood in front of my car, came around to the driver's side, and went, can you still sign this? And I went, are you joking? God. <laughs> well, I was like, oh. So, and, and, and they also like, you know, they'll, they'll sort of tell you what they think of you <laughs> as the character. <laughs> it was like, they believed I was Zainab, and they would just say, like when I was playing this homophobe, I had this woman in the supermarket, who was really horrible to me. She, was like, she actually punched me on the arm. Like, she, she had something in her arm, she punched me, and she went, my son's gay and you're disgusting like this and walked off and I went I'm not actually the character my character's a homophobe I'm not yeah uh, wouldn't have mattered she was convinced that that was that or I used to get people who would go why do you talk like that you know like talk why, do, why are you talking with the accent you know where's your accent you go no I put on the Pakistani accent for Zainab you know I'm not actually Pakistani so and it's they it just mind boggles them. It's like, how did you do that? It's just you. You talked about the, these great people you've worked with, Sir David Jason in in Still Open All Hours. He is a, a, a walking masterclass in comedy. Does he dispense that, or or do you just observe? A bit of both. When when you have a scene just with him, uh, he if he thinks something's going to work better, he will tell you and you will listen <laughs> you can argue back but you will listen um and you know and and you want to listen because you look at his career and go gosh if i had half that career geez you know he's very precise with how he wants to learn his lines and how he you know wants to rehearse it um he's very careful with his energy levels he's you know he's he's got his routine yeah, yeah. um but you know you're working with someone special because yeah. You feel it. There are certain actors you come across where you just feel like you're you're in the presence of something very great. Thank you. One of them. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. Your podcast. You, you you didn't have to say it, Nina, but you chose to. Bless you for that. Bless you. I can't you. wait to see how this is edited. I do. I do. I do feel some of my guests don't treat me with perhaps the reverence they should. But they, you, you've been so refreshing. So what's the what what's the future then? What what's what what are you doing? And what would you ideally be doing? The Outlaws is out right now. Um, oh yes, yes. And we've because Steve's a big friend of mine, Steve Merchant, and oh, we've seen incredible. the first. He's a lovely man, isn't he? He is incredible. He's another one where I thought. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this has come my way. Don't say how tall he is. <laughs> First thing I do, oh my God, <laughs> how tall I am. Well, he's, 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 lud he's ludicrously tall and and he really should he should do something about it. I mean, I, I, I've told him, surely there's something he could do. <laughs> well, you know, the funniest thing is when he was directing our stuff and we were the first up when, when we started the show. And occasionally you just hear, ow, and you know it's Stephen had just walked into a door frame. <laughs> you just go, this poor man. Uh, and but but going forward, what what yes, is? So I've got what's um, Sandman, uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, graphic novel that's happening yes. over at Netflix. So I play uh, one of the fates, Mother Fate, in that, which is very extraordinary, uh, very different to anything I've done before. I've got my second little book coming out. So my first book is Bionic T1D that was written about. Yes. Um, you know, kids with type one and just to ex so that it's explained to them about what that is, type yeah. one diabetes. My second one's coming out later this year. It's a, a little kid's kind of, you know, a picture storybook. It's called The Hearthead Family. It's the hearthead's who are us, uh, basically, but just in a, in a, a kind of format that's uh, hopefully appealing to kids. Um, so that's, that's out later this year. 
I've got my little podcast I was telling you about called An Actor's Life for Me, where yes. I talk to the actors I've worked with who yes. I admire and really enjoy. So you're you're on my list, Rob. Well, it's a very <laughs> long list because I've not had a, I've not had a sniff of it, nothing. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that as well. I mean, I've got some availability in late 2024. I mean, I could probably <laughs> probably fit you in, I suppose. But I mean, I'm rather affronted that it's taken you this long. Oh, no, I feel bad. Nina, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Oh, no, same. Thank you. You're so so easy to talk to, so thank you. Well, <laughs> easy to talk to, but not easy to connect with. But we're, we're forgetting now about our, t our technical problems seem a lifetime ago now, don't they? <laughs> Lovely to speak to you. Thanks, Nina. Cheers. No problem. Thank Thank you, take care. <laughs>